Good day, chaps and chapettes. So, today's video is quite a special one. It has been the culmination of several years of searching and looking, and I have finally ticked off another rare tank from my long list of obscure projects to find. This is a tank that fills a gap in development that has been, for the most part, forgotten or overlooked, and yet played a vital role in the development of British armoured doctrine post-World War II. This is the FV-201, the first universal tank, the first true main battle tank. The story of the FV-201 is a tale that has been muddied and confused, overlooked and written out of history books. Yet without this vehicle, we wouldn't have had Conqueror, and had fate been kinder to it, we may well never have had the Centurion for as long as we did. Over the last decade, authors have attempted to find this vehicle with varying levels of success. Certainly a lot of new information has come to light, but one thing always eluded them. What did the vehicle look like, perhaps in its final form, before cancellation? And today, for the first time, we'll get to see this. But where do we begin? What is the origin of this tank? And why was it never put into service? For this, we have to leap back to 1944, and not to the Centurion, but to another doomed project, the A43 Black Prince. This vehicle from Vauxhalls was, in all reality, an obsolete design from its conception to its end. The Black Prince was a heavier version of the late Churchill tank, albeit with no increased protection than the former. The vehicle's only real difference was the mounting of a 17-pounder gun in the new turret. But while the increase in firepower was the right step, the rest was sadly not. The vehicle was to retain the same underpowered Bedford 12-cylinder, 350-horsepower engine of its predecessor, in a hull now weighing some 10 tons more, giving it a rather paltry top speed of just 7 miles per hour across country. Yet while Vauxhalls were determined to get this vehicle into production, with strong backing from various ministers and industrial heads, there were those that were voicing concern, notably the director of the Royal Armoured Corps, Raymond Briggs, and the deputy director of General Fighting Vehicles, Brigadier William Blagden, and other Department of Tank Design Engineers. There was quite a division in thinking at this time in tank design. There were those who still held to the concept of tanks designed to meet very specific requirements, which had led to the fiasco of infantry tanks and cruiser tanks in the first place, which had later split into other subclasses, such as heavy tanks, light tanks, assault tanks, and so forth. While others, usually those using the actual vehicles themselves, including Montgomery, felt that what was needed was a capital tank, later redesignated universal tank, a vehicle able to perform all roles and mount any equipment needed for a given purpose. Both Briggs and Blagden, who, throughout the war years, had shown a somewhat rare trait of common sense and foresight, raised questions on the development of the Black Prince, notably along the lines of, why? They had in development the A41 Centurion, which was looking quite promising, featured the same firepower, and was considerably more mobile, having a Rolls-Royce Meteor engine. And at this stage of the war, they saw little gain to be had from the A43, and certainly no place for it in post-war years. Briggs was arguably the most outspoken on the subject, flatly refusing to endorse the project if it did not have a meaningful engine, and yet often overridden in his attempt to have the project quashed, despite his best attempts to keep it away from the army via trials feedback and stalling attempts at bureaucratic levels. Yet Vauxhalls had made powerful friends in the government, and were able to bullishly plough on with this infantry tank concept. This back and forth continued until Briggs felt that if a new infantry type vehicle should begin, then it should be built on the A41 platform and it was given the A45 designation. Now, quite when A45 was finally built as a soft boat prototype, it was a bit more complex, with various sources stating between January 1945 to around mid-1946, 
and even who built it is somewhat problematic, with both English Electric and the DTD making claims. What is clear is that the obsolete infantry tank notion is fully dropped and the universal tank name applied, while Centurion is still classed as a heavy cruiser and later medium tank. So what separates these two vehicles, which at a glance have a somewhat similar layout and style? The answer lies in what they are capable of in terms of adaptability to roles over any direct hard statistic. The A45 was from the outset designed to mount a variety of equipment to overcome any obstacle it may face rather than relying on support vehicles. This included the use of flamethrowers, mine flails, bulldozers, DD equipment, and even discussion on converting it into a heavy APC, whilst also being so adjustable as to have a family of vehicles using the same basic chassis for different, more dedicated roles. Furthermore, the extension or fittings would be powered by the vehicle itself and not from an outsider added source with easy changes to whatever was required in the field, yet retaining a weapon able to meet any threat, the protection to survive that threat, and the mobility to be where it was needed. The same could not be said of Centurion. Now that's not to say the Centurion could not mount such equipment. It could, but not without extensive reworking of the vehicle's interior or exterior, nor could the vehicle power these itself. While the Universal Tank had a built-in PTO, or power takeoff unit, a device that helped transfer an engine's mechanical power to other equipment, both hydraulic and electrical. This, coupled with the vehicle's design of not only having a driver, but a secondary forward crewman, and a kind of plug-and-play style set of electrical fittings inside, allowed a very rapid adoption of anything that was required of it. At around this time, other changes were happening within the UK Army structure system. Gone were the days of the A numbers, and a new FV system was put into place. This would set out a new sequential system of vehicles with a base vehicle class, and then the subsequent vehicle in that family having corresponding numbers. And so the Universal Tanks would become the FV200 series, with A45 becoming the FV201 the gun tank, with the first vehicle made designated FV-201-P1, or prototype number one. However, at this point, it is still very much within its conceptual stage. P1 itself is only a mild steel body, the gun is a 17-pounder, and the side skirts are more akin to a centurion. There were, of course, several distinct differences. The most obvious is the suspension and running gear and this will become of critical importance later on. But, rather than the larger road wheels of the Centurion, the FV201 used eight smaller resilient steel road wheels, which were originally based on the German style used in some late war designs, and the wider track itself, which changed a few times, was supported by six return rollers. This suspension carried over onto the other FV201 variants, such as the FV203 AVRE. Another obvious feature was the small gun blister to one side. This 70mm armoured protrusion came about somewhat later on, as the earlier drawings show a hull-mounted .30 Browning machine gun in a bull mount, but this was moved, as such fittings reduced the armour's integrity in an area around it, and so it was placed offset to the left-hand side. And of course, this leads to another addition, with that extra crewman. This fifth crewman was located to the driver's left, where tanks like Centurion usually kept extra ammunition, with the primary role of operating the additional fittings, such as the machine gun, or the additional equipment as needed, allowing the other crew to focus on their specific roles. And, due to the larger overall volume of the FV-201, this did not actually hinder the ammunition count, which came in at 74 rounds to the Centurion's 65 rounds. The gun for the FV-201 was envisioned to be the 20-pounder from the outset, which had begun in late 1944 and was ready in 1945. This new weapon offered a lot of advantages over the 17-pounder. 
a new type of APDS based on the pot type first developed for the Airborne 2 pounder was to be used, which it was hoped would solve some of the poor accuracy issues of the former. While the vehicle was also a fully rotating fighting basket, which at the time Centurion lacks, as well as a built in rangefinder and a positional gyro stabilizer over the rate measuring stabilizer on the Centurions. Finally, the engine was more powerful, with originally a 750 horsepower petrol injected Meteor coupled to a Z52 gearbox planned. This was later updated to a Mark 12 engine although others have been listed in various sources. So, with all that said and done, let's have a look at today's vehicle and why it's quite special. This vehicle is the FV201 P3, with P1 being the original A45 and P2 being the planned flamethrower testbed later gutted out for automotive testing. But this is the first time, to the best of our knowledge, that the vehicle has ever been seen with a 20 pounder gun fitted and as said previously, is probably as far as it ever got before the project cancelled. This vehicle was used as a duplex drive testbed with an erectable canvas screen from a Topi style mount and propelled by rear mounted propellers and a rudder. Prior to this, the only known photo was of this vehicle with full screens up and often recorded as just a Carnarvon, which it isn't. But how to tell the two apart quickly? Well, for that we have to go back to the suspension. The later FV221s and 214s have a suspension that can visually be described as a 1, 2, 1, 1, 2, 1 layout. Now, before you take to the comments section, these aren't the suspension points, but rather a visual guide for quickly counting the wheels and the pattern. While the FV201 prototypes, including A45 and the AVRE, are in a 1, 2, 2, 2, 1 layout. This is the first and most important clue as to what this tank is, particularly as the skirts cover up the side return rollers. The next clues are a bit fainter, but we have to come around to the front end. Here, with the screen down, we can just make out the hump of the machine gun blister, which should have housed the Browning Point 30. And while somewhat hidden under the canvas folds, it is still there. But of course the biggest reveal is the turret. As said, the only known photos were of the soft boat mock-up of the 17 pounder, and a photo possibly of P2, which had a turret but no gun and ballast blocks added. But to find the vehicle with the turret and the gun has been most elusive, and with over 21,000 pages gone through the National Archives, these are to date the only ones I found of this complete vehicle. This turret alone has also caused some debate. Having shared it with a few very knowledgeable individuals on the Centurion, the answer isn't quite set, with a Mark II 3 being the best description, having some features of both, with aspects of the earlier Mark II, but lacking the rear gun removal hatch like the later Mark III. It is most likely a transitional turret to the two different versions. This amphibious version was used in trials to see how well the vehicle could swim, and what speeds could be achieved both theoretically and in practicality. The desired goal was six knots, but the reality was closer to four, with an estimated engine boost of 1,100 horsepower needed to reach the former. It was also one of the major downfalls in the design. It was discovered that with the wading gear up, the FV201 could not safely be used to get on or off a landing ship tank, which at the time severely hindered its role, as we couldn't fly a tank in, and that meant for an operation over waters, moving the FV201 series was going to be tricky without commissioning an entirely new class of landing ship. However, even during the late stage of testing, the FV201's fate was already being set. In joint armament discussions with the Americans, and in light of new information on Russian tanks, it was felt that the future vehicle should have a bigger gun. The US listed the use of three weapons the 120mm for heavy tanks, a 90mm for medium, and a 76mm gun for light tanks, all conveniently American calibers. While the latter two were dismissed, the first was accepted, and the British moved forwards to putting a 120mm gun into service. This new vehicle was given the designation 
FV214, and later named Conqueror. It was also considered that the FV201, as it was, did not offer enough suitable protection, and this too would need to be raised. However, by 1949, the FV201 project was cancelled. Thus, the new Conqueror project began. However, while they had ideas of what holes to use, or base their project on, the turret itself would take a few more years to develop. Vickers began to rework some new hulls based on the FV-201, which should be used for the FV-214, and fitted with a Centurion Mark III turret under the name of Interim Medium Tank FV-221 Carnarvon. Carnarvon itself is different. The suspension, as we mentioned, changes, and the extra crewman is gone, as is the power takeoff unit. The vehicle would no longer be able to operate any extra goodies attached to it. However, this did shorten the hull by a few inches and allow a little extra armour to be added to the front. Also gone was a small machine gun blister, and those rear decks now have that humpbacked look. The number of Carnarvons built were extremely limited, and were only ever used in training for the new hull, while the turret was under development, with most being converted to conquerors after this. Of the FV-201 tanks, some survived into the early 50s, still being used up as trials vehicles for various projects, before going to the breakers' yards. Of the three made and the AVRE, none now survive. The story of the FV-201 is an odd one for sure. What began as a desire to break away from a clumsy infantry tank to become the world's first universal tank able to fulfil all roles on the battlefield slowly did almost a complete circle and ended up being a slow and unwieldy heavy tank again. While many years and a small fortune were later spent on trying to adapt other vehicles in service to fulfil the same secondary tasks, with modifications to Churchills and Centurions, none of which ever quite proved as successful in this perceived role. Well, I hope you enjoyed this brief overview of this vehicle. I was very happy to find these pictures of this tank, and maybe one day in the future I'll find more. There is of course a lot we can't cover, for brevity's sake, and to be honest a lack of images. But this tends to be the nitty gritty stuff like seat foam filler and nut and bolt adjustments, which are probably better suited to published materials than a quick video. But if you did enjoy this, let me know, or indeed, dare I say, drop a subscribe. And until next time, toodle pip. <laughs>